Well, where do you want to start? Well, I won't go all the way back to the beginning because I don't remember that. But um, I think I had an interest in going into science from the eight, uh, age of eight. I had written a, a composition in school about what I want to be when I grow up, and I wrote I want to be a scientist and help struggling humanity. And I guess I had that idea all the way through. Uh, when I got to college, I started out in pre-med, and I was like, well, I don't know, maybe I'd go in philosophy. I was looking for answers to why people are where they are. And uh, then I found, no, philosophy doesn't offer real answers either. So I went into psychology, and then someone, my philosophy professor, told me, uh, why become a psychologist and end up working for a psychiatrist? Why don't you be a psychiatrist? So I said, okay, and I went to med school with that idea in mind and uh, never changed that. I took my residency at Walter Reed um, and just as I was completing my residency, uh, Dr. David Riach, who was the head of the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, called me in. Uh, and said, they need a psychiatrist up at Edgewood Arsenal. Would you be interested in going up there and helping them out with their research? And uh, that sounded kind of unique. So I went up there and looked at it, and yeah, it was crazy enough to appeal to me. <laughs> uh, I was always oriented more toward the biological side of psychiatry. I used to kid the others about Freud, etc. Uh, I got up there in early 61, and this was just not long after the uh, volunteer program had been started. Um, kind of interesting, people think the Army uh, had some ulterior motive and wanted to develop some gas that would drive people crazy and make them violent. We didn't have any such intention. We wanted to spare lives if possible by using a drug that would incapacitate someone for a certain period of time, but they would recover without any lasting effects, and we could keep them safe while we were testing them if they were disoriented. We eventually got padded rooms, we got nurses. So we really had a full medical testing setup. Uh, over 60 doctors took part in our program. and. Uh, BZ was the focus of interest. Uh, I'll come back to that later, but I served most of the decade of the 60s, 1960s at Edgewood, uh, except for two years at Stanford where they allowed me to go for postdoctoral work in neuropsychology. I thought I could bring pharmacology and neuropsychology together and produce marvelous insights that would help the uh, Army Medical Corps and the whole world, you know. Uh, I pitched it this way and for some reason they bought it and I got to go for two years to Stanford in civilian clothes with no one to report to and completely on my own. That was amazing. It happened to coincide with the uh, hippie uh, years, 66, 67, and uh, of course, they interested me, I, and I was not far from San Francisco, so I learned there was a free clinic there. David Smith had just started his free clinic, first one in America. And I went up there one day a week as a volunteer and saw some of the kids who had taken LSD or PCP or whatever coming in. Uh, usually they were overdosing back then, they didn't know how much to take taking 300 micrograms of LSD, for example, well, that'll drive anyone out of their mind. And I think some of them were giving it covertly to their friends, kind of as a joke. It wasn't a very good joke for some of them. So we got people coming in in various stages of disturbance and we tried to talk them down, or in some cases use uh, mild drugs like Valium to uh, come down with. And I didn't tell the, uh, I saw some individuals there weekly in psychotherapy, because 
obviously they wanted some they want some counseling so I, there were two people I saw repeatedly and they didn't know I was in the army doing chemical warfare research they were all probably pretty opposed to that idea but eventually I had to tell them I was going back to Maryland and resume my work <laughs> chemical warfare I was really a lieutenant colonel <laughs> and they were slightly taken aback but actually they forgave me and I even had mail from one of them uh, telling me how his life was going and so on. I took some movies even. I, I went up there in a brown uh, businessman suit and tie uh, one day when they were all out. I've forgotten what the particular occasion was but everyone was out on, on uh, Haight Street uh, in their garb, their fur coats and their tie-dyes and there were all these uh, motorcyclists with uh, helmets that had American flags on them. And I just stood there and took pictures of them and they didn't seem to mind. And uh, Some old guy though, who was obviously a resident, <laughs> walked by and gave me this look. It's, it's on the film. <laughs> um, I guess he thought I was a Hollywood guy trying to make some money by taking pictures. Well, anyway, I went back to Edgewood, and by this time the program was phasing down. I won't go into all the details of what we studied right now, but uh, I think it was phasing down in part because the Army had pulled in its horns. It didn't want to use something so bizarre and novel as a chemical. Even if they said it was incapacitating, people would say, oh, no, you're just trying to poison people. So I think they were afraid of the publicity. And, they pulled back, uh, eventually destroyed all of EZ, and uh, as far as I know. Uh, the program was winding down when I returned from Stanford, and uh, I think one reason was that uh, the Vietnam War had stirred up a lot of anti-military and anti-government sentiment, anti-army sentiment. There was a feeling that you know, we were using Agent Orange at the time, and probably anything else the Army was doing with chemicals wasn't very legitimate either. So public opinion began to, we never had any complaints in the beginning of the 60s, but in the latter part there were a number of people who uh, began to protest what the Army was doing. I didn't have any problem with what I was doing because we were working to find a drug that would save lives rather than kill them unnecessarily. And back in 1955, this started when the Chemical Corps Chief, uh, Major General Creasy, uh, read about LSD. Now, he wasn't a physician or a pharmacologist, but he thought, gosh, this stuff puts you out in space for a period of time, and then you come back, and okay. So, um, he went to Congress and told them about this. He said we could float a cloud of this down over San Francisco, for example, and uh, incapacitate everyone, and then go in and pick up all the crooks, you know, and then come out, and everyone would recover and go back to what they were doing, and no harm, no foul, you know. But uh, that really wasn't a very uh, accurate portrayal. Nevertheless, Congress was fascinated by this. And uh, they said, well, could you incapacitate us here in the Congress with this gas? And he said, well, so far I haven't found it necessary to do so. He's getting a little grandiose about this. Well, anyway, every member of Congress but one voted to triple the Chemical Corps budget and to go ahead and study LSD and volunteers. So this was not something the Army invented. This was something that the Congress was behind. And they made up a set of 10 guidelines that they felt should be followed uh, in this research. And we followed all of them, but one that the Army chose not to follow very closely was to keep the public informed at all times of what we were doing. That was one of the items in the list. And by failing to do that, I think the Army lost a lot of credibility. And up to this day, many people don't trust the military. So, uh, in 1971 I left and went on to do other things, uh, teaching, 